Okay, welcome everybody to another of our weekly seminars hosted by the Simons Bootstrap Collaboration. And today we are very glad to have King Shuan Lin from Harvard telling us numerical evidence for a Hagerup conformal field theory. Uh, thank you, Leonardo. So um, uh, thanks for letting me share this uh, work with you today and thanks for coming. So uh, here are my uh, excellent collaborators, uh, Tijin Huang, Kantaro Omori, Yuji Tachikawa, and Masaki Tezuka. <clears throat> so I will start um, with the saying of a, of a wise man. And the saying goes as, anomalies must hold both in the high, high energy region and in the low energy region. And we all know that this wise man is none other than Gerald Atuft. So uh, this wisdom of Atuft um, cast in a I guess, slightly more modern language is saying that anomalies are something topological and rigid, and they are invariant under continuous deformations of your theory, uh, such as RG flows. So given a UV system with a certain anomaly, the IR, uh, must have sufficient degrees of freedom to realize that anomaly. So for example, if we're talking about the chiral anomaly, then you need um, sufficiently many uh, chiral charged fermions uh, when, you, when you compute the triangle diagram. But I think the most, the simplest realization of this wisdom is perhaps the following statement. Any 2D system with an anomalous Z2 symmetry cannot be trivially gapped. Uh, meaning that it cannot be gapped, and it, well, uh, if it's gapped, it cannot only have one ground state uh, without spontaneously, spontaneous symmetry breaking. And why is this? So if this system is gapped, then the infrared should be described by a 2D topological field theory that realizes this anomaly, so this anomalous Z2 symmetry. And it's a mathematically rigorous statement that there simply does not exist any Z2 anomalous TFT with only a single state. So that's the underlying reason for this statement. Okay, so anomaly can certainly forbid a system uh, to be trivially gapped. Can it forbid a system to be gapless? So that's a question you can ask. How uh, can we possibly prove or show such a statement? So suppose somehow we know that uh, an anomaly cannot be realized by any CFT. So, so assume that we somehow know that for sure. Then uh, an, a Lorentz invariant system that has this anomaly uh, cannot be gapless because if it's, if it's gapless, then we expect it to be described by a CFT that has this anomaly. Um, and here I'm assuming that there's no spontaneous symmetry breaking. Um, otherwise you can always just take the tensor product with the TFT. And uh, in the following, um, the, when I say CFT, it's always going to be a 2D unitary compact CFT. And by compact, I don't just mean that the spectrum is discrete. I further require that there's a unique ground state. <clears throat> so the original cross, original question, if you assume you know, a unique ground state, um, can be cast into this uh, contrapositive uh, question, which is, can every anomaly be realized by CFT? I don't know of any anomaly that is proven to be unrealizable by CFT. And in fact, um, in uh, 2D, there is a mathematical conjecture that would imply that any finite group anomaly is always realizable. So if you're a physicist, then sort of the motivation up to here is perhaps a, uh, well, if you believe that um, finite group anomaly should not be powerful enough to forbid gaplessness, then that's the motivation for this conjecture. But this conjecture, the root of this conjecture is from deep connections from uh, 2D CFT, 
to quantum groups, the factors, para groups, and uh, all sorts of tensor categories. The conjecture uh, actually implies something stronger. It implies not just so not just finite group uh, anomalies, but any generalized finite symmetry in two D can be realized by CFT. Okay, so to understand what I mean, I have to uh, introduce what generalized finite symmetries are in 2D. And to do that, um, let me first uh, remind you what a, an ordinary symmetry is. So um, I think probably most of us uh, subconsciously associate a symmetry with a group. And uh, if we're talking about uh, you know, quantum mechanics or a quantum system, then uh, every symmetry or every yeah, every symmetry has in a, has a has every theory has um, every theory with the symmetry has some a two -fold anomaly. So in quantum in in a quantum system, these two are inseparable. So I think the two together should uh, is what we mean by an ordinary symmetry. For a generalized symmetry. We replace groups by rings, and uh, the a tooth anomaly um, is actually can actually be generalized to um, something called the six J symbols. Okay, so um, when I speak of six J symbols, you might, you know, you might be more familiar with uh, the the six J symbols defined for ereps of a group. Right, um, these are sort of just. Uh, changes of, of, of bases when you take tensor products of representations. Um, so actually, the ereps of a group, they furnish a very typical example of a generalized symmetry, and it's often called rep G, uh, a very intuitive, intuitive name, I believe. Um, and so what is the ring structure? The ring structure, so the, the addition is nothing but the direct sum of ereps, and the multiplication is the tensor product. Sorry, one second. I seem to see someone who raised their hand in the chat. Just please unmute yourself and ask the question. I think the seminar is rather informal. Sorry, uh, yeah, I have a question. Uh, so, so Ying, you mentioned two conjectures uh, on the last slide by mathematicians. Yeah. The realizability uh, of a finite group with anomalies in CFT versus the re realizability of uh, this generalized finite symmetries. Uh, yeah. Are you saying that in the mathematical sense, one implies the other, the first one implies the second? No, no. I'm saying that uh, there's a mathematical conjecture and right. it implies the stronger statement, which is the second. But the second ah, statement okay. good, uh, good. You know, includes the first one. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, in full screen mode, I can't really see the chats. So please just, as Leonardo said, just, just directly ask me if you have questions. Okay, so, um, so ereps of a group is a generalized symmetry, or well, they form a generalized symmetry. An ordinary symmetry is also a generalized symmetry. So to go from a group to a ring, you do something very trivial, which is you just allow direct sum of elements. And it turns out, that um, for finite groups, the a tooth anomaly can also be captured by the six J symbols. I will not explain how. The most general uh, symmetries uh, go beyond just uh, groups and ereps of groups that uh, I, I introduced. Um, there's a certain set of axioms that define a generalized symmetry and it's mathematically called a fusion category. So, uh, so in 2D, sometimes this is called a fusion category symmetry. And unlike groups, rings have no uh, multiplicative inverse. So because of this, it's also sometimes called a, a non-invertible symmetry if it's not described by, uh, by a group. Um, these names might seem a little scary if you've not seen them before, um, but uh, generalized symmetries are uh, ubiquitous and fundamental to 2D quantum systems. So pick, so pick any two. Quick question. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned two examples, rep G and the group ring of G. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. these are two different ways to associate generalized symmetry to a group? 
Uh, yeah, there, there are more than two, uh, but yes, yes. Okay. Uh, are you going to explain uh, how this generalized symmetry acts or something? Uh, uh, yeah, I'll, I will mention that. Uh, I'll mention that a little later. And if it's not enough, then just please ask out. I can say more. Okay, so um, just pick any 2D CFT, pick your favorites. It's, it's likely going to have tons of uh, generalized symmetries that are not described by groups. Um, I, I, in fact, don't know any uh, 2D CFT that does not have any, you know, non-invertible symmetry. And most things you can do with ordinary symmetries, you can also do with generalized symmetries. Things like anomaly matching, as you just explained, uh, anomaly inflow, and gauging, all sorts of things. And I think one of the most uh, beautiful things that come out of uh, thinking about generalized symmetries is that now orbifolding is generally, it's, it's an invertible operation. <clears throat> so what do I mean? So uh, you might be familiar with uh, the orbifold by a cyclic group. So it's long known that when you or if you orbifold by Zn, then uh, the orbifold theory has a dual quantum symmetry um, that, so I call it tilde Zn. And if you further gauge the orbifold theory, or so if you further orbifold by this Z, uh, tilde Zn um, of the orbifold theory, you go back to the original theory. So there's an, there's an inverse operation of, of orbifolding if you do it for a cyclic group. But um, uh, in the old days, if you uh, orbifold by a, by a, say a non-abelian non finite group, then it seems that this invertibility is lost. Um, but the fact is that there is a, there's a dual symmetry, which is uh, none other than this rep G that I introduced. And there's a way to gauge that rep G. And you go back to the original theory. And um, generalized symmetries, they're not just, you know, they're not just of interest to uh, say pure theorists, they can be manifestly built into lattice models as we'll soon see. So they're very real is, is what I'm trying to say. Um, and in the following, um, I'm not going to say all the, you know, the entire phrase generalized finite symmetry always, uh, sometimes I'll just, you know, abbreviate as symmetry. Well, do you have a reference for that or orbifolding rep G inverts the orbit orbifolding over G? Uh, yeah. Um, so uh, I learned this from uh, from a paper by uh, Yuji Tachikawa and uh, Laksha Bhagwa. Sorry if I'm pronouncing the, the name wrong. Great. Okay. I'll find it. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, so the, all right, so uh, now that I've introduced what a generalized symmetry is. No, but I'm um, sorry, uh, you have not introduced what generalized symmetry is. You just said a lot of bunch of things about generalized symmetry, but you did not explain what it is. Uh, so I don't understand, uh -huh. uh, yeah. yeah. You have to define what it is. You didn't define it. That's true. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so given so, that it's so, defined, it's hard to say what it means that it can be realized by CFT. Let, let me make sure. So you, you are complaining that you don't understand how it's realized in the, in the CF, for example, in the CFT, right? Exactly. You're not complaining yeah. about the structure. Exactly. Okay, so good. So, um, the, so the generalized symmetry, so we have, we, have a, we have a ring, we have a bunch of ring elements and each of these, these ring elements can be represented by an operator on your Hilbert space, okay? And these operators, so these are maps from the Hilbert space to Hilbert space, which is what we mean by operator. And these operators um, under multiplication, they satisfy precisely this, uh, this ring structure. Okay. So that, that's how it's realized. That's one way it's realized um, in a QFT. Okay. Okay. Th uh, yeah. Thanks for thanks for the question. 
All right. Uh, so, Ying, yeah. uh, I just have a question out of curiosity. So you mentioned that uh, all CFTs that you know have non-inverbal symmetries, and they're certainly ubiquitous. But uh, in the SU two level one, what is an example of a non-inverbal oh. symmetry? SU two level one. So that's just yeah, I don't the free know boson. Any. Yeah. Wait, wait. That, that's just a free boson, right? I know. It's a self dual radius. Yeah, but uh, I mean, didn't you didn't you study all sorts of non-invertible symmetries that they all become invertible yeah. at this point? Oh, they've all become invertible at this point. Yeah. Okay, so I guess that's just a question out, out of example. curiosity. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so that's probably that's probably an example. Okay, so yeah, thanks for the comment. Um, all right, so let, let me get back to this question of uh, can every symmetry, can every generalized symmetry be realized by a CFT? And well, maybe, but first there's a, there's a mystery that um, we want to solve. So there's a, there's a particular symmetry whose realization in CFT is, is still not known despite years of searching. And so now it's now I should introduce this uh, this gentleman. Um, and before I say anything, I uh, I want to just play the um, the pronunciation of his name uh, that I found online by supposedly a uh, a Danish person. So he's Danish. Oh. Can you hear? Oh. Oh. And. Uh, so in this talk, I will try to do my best uh, imitation uh, of this, which is uh, how well. Um, I'm sure it's, it's very bad. Um, um, sorry for that. All right. So in 1998, uh, how and Asaida constructed an, an exotic symmetry that did not fit into any systematic construction uh, known at the time. Um, so, uh, if you compare sort of the discovery of exotic symmetry, or more precisely, uh, say fusion categories, uh, if you compare that with the discovery of finite simple groups, then I think you can sort of uh, liken uh, Hauwa to the Matthew groups, since they are the first known sporadic groups. Okay, and all right, so for the Hauwa symmetry, um, candidate. CFT partition functions have been proposed by Evans and Gannon, but the, the realization in terms of, say, a vertex operator algebra is, is still unknown. It's an open question. Uh, sorry, in, in the candidate partition function, what's the central charge? Um, eight. Eight. Okay, yeah. interesting. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, so. Uh, what is this how whoop symmetry? Um, it contains a non-anomalous Z3 subgroup. So part of it is just a, a group a, or a group ring. Um, I, I'm going to uh, denote its generator by A. So we have three elements, the, the identity, A, and A squared. But in addition, there are three more uh, simple elements and they form a non-trivial Z3 orbit uh, so if we, if we call one of them rho, then we can label the other two as uh, a rho and a squared rho. So we have six in total. The fusion ring, so I'm just, so here I write down two relations uh, in the fusion ring. Um, the first one, a rho equals rho a squared, shows you that this fusion is non-commutative. Um, the second one I write down, uh, so this row squared is the, the, the identity plus, you know, the whole Z3 orbit of these extra elements shows that it's not invertible because if it were invertible, then the right-hand side should only have one. It should not have all these extra stuff. All right, so, so, so these are the indecomposable elements. Um, this is part of the fusion ring. And in a, so in a quantum system, in a CFT or even a, or a lattice model, these elements, uh, say A and rho, 
they act as operators on the Hilbert space. <clears throat> and states form representations of this fusion ring. This is just like ordinary symmetries. So for instance, let's consider a state that is neutral under the Z3. So the Z3 part, let me remind you again, is this one A, A squared. So if it's neutral, it means that it has uh, the A eigenvalue is one, All right? So now let's examine the, this, uh, this relation rho, uh, for rho squared. Since A acts trivially, uh, this reduces to rho squared equals one plus three rho. And we conclude that in this Z3 neutral sector, rho has eigenvalues, uh, well, the, the two roots of this, this equation. Okay, so um, you, see, you see a signature of non-invertibility in these eigenvalues because these are not can, roots of unity. Can I ask a naive question since I don't have much experience with this uh, generalized symmetry? So mm -hmm. can you give us an idea of uh, like what else do you have to check in order to see if these are good rules. Like for example, if instead of one plus rho, I would write one plus two rho, then I presume it wouldn't be a good rule. So what would go wrong? Like what should I check compared to the, in addition to the formulas that I wrote? Okay, good. So, um, so mathematically, you need this ring to be compatible with the whole structure of a fusion category, right? So, um, you have to define a set of things called associators and you have to check that the Pentagon identity is a fake. So if we did not have these extra elements A, this is in fact, uh, this row squared equals one plus three row is in fact inconsistent. There is no fusion category that realizes it. Um, and if you're asking about, well, uh, sort of physical, physical manifestations um, of the symmetry other than just what I wrote here, um, then, so these symmetries are generally embodied in topological defects. And um, once you realize that, uh, so topological defect, if you have it you know, extended, so if you have this topological line extended in the spatial direction, then it basically just implements these operators on the Hilbert space, but you can you know, do other things with it. So for example, you can, you can let it extend in the time direction. And it, it, it lets you twist your Hilbert spin. So your, your theory on a circle now has twisted periodic boundary conditions. And that Hilbert space still has to have, you know, it has, it has to be a good Hilbert space. So it has to say, uh, have like integer degeneracies, et cetera, et cetera. So, so there, are, there are other um, cons like physically, there are other physical consistency conditions that they have to obey. But here, I, I didn't want to go into all those details. So um, I'm just describing sort of um, the things that you have to know as uh, later when we, for example, look at the numerical data. Uh, a quick question. So what's so special about this symmetry? It just looks like a, you know, another just regular ordinary ring. Can I pick I know, some other ring? Yeah, so this uh, Hallwolf symmetry, uh, well, so historically it's special for this reason I wrote here. So in the beginning when people, uh, well, okay, so all this sort of study started from like not theory. And um, most of the, these generalized symmetries that uh, people first wrote down, they, they almost, so instead of saying that, like realizing them in CFT, like you can almost think of them as coming from CFT. Okay, but this symmetry was not constructed like that way. It was through some brute force calculation to show that you know, there exists sort of, sort of a set of consistent data. And so that's why I bring up this analogy to sporadic groups. So it, it doesn't fit into any systematic uh, construction. So that's sort of the historical reason. Um, a second reason is that uh, by some measure it is, um, it is also the, the simplest exotic symmetry. Uh, so what do I mean? So um, gen these generalized symmetries, uh, well, um, together with some other data, so you can define something called the, the Jones index. And uh, above 
some kind of ADE classification, it has the smallest Jones index. So it's it's in some sense the sort of the simplest exotic symmetry. Is is that is that a satisfactory answer? Uh, yeah, yeah. Is it is it the case that the corresponding fusion I, I, is it the corresponding fusion category not braided or something like that? I, I think it's I've not heard braided. It's is not it the braided, simplest one that's not? It's not. No, it's not. It's not. So there okay. are. Um, yeah, it's not. Okay. But um, many of the uh, not the non-braided examples or ones that cannot be lifted to MTC, they can, like you can think of them as coming from an, uh, one that's braided and then under some Oprah fold. But this one you cannot. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, okay, any more, any more questions before I move on? Uh, sorry, just just to uh, make sure something I missed. So you mentioned that uh, the mathematicians already have sampling function that realized the Hagorov symmetry. In what sense? Uh, it's it's for the double of the Hagorov. Ah, for the double. They, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the so that um the double is realized as as the Verlinde symmetry of of the of this uh, putative CFT. Uh, putative meaning the VOA is not known. The VOA is not known. Just the just consistent characters uh, are known. I see. Thank you. So uh, yeah. So don't worry if you did not understand this conversation. It's not important to my talk. <clears throat> All right. So now the the problem is to find a CFT that realizes that uh, Wolf symmetry. So how do we approach this problem? Um, two ways uh, come into mind, at, at least for me. So first you might think, okay, let's just uh, bootstrap uh, Hao Wolf. Um, I, I, won't, I won't really, well, okay, so the second way is to study a system that has built in a warp symmetry and then try to find a CFT, try to find a conformal fixed point. And it is approach two that we undertake in this work. Um, because this is a bootstrap seminar, I will comment a little bit on approach one towards the end of the talk, but I don't want to break up the, the flow of the talk. So, um, so let me tell you how, what kind of system has built in a warp symmetry. So, uh, so there is something called an anion chain. And to define it, uh, the input data is a generalized symmetry, uh, which as I described before, uh, is essentially the fusion ring plus some 6J symbols, together with a choice of an element. So once you have this input, we consider a periodic 1D lattice uh, with L sites. L for length, and each site has n labels, and n is the number of indecomposable elements in the well in the fusion ring fork. So for Hauwop, for example, n will be six. <clears throat> the basis states of this uh, quantum spin chain is labeled by uh, so you can label it by x one to x l, and each x takes values in the indecomposable elements. So from one to n, but very importantly, um, the states that uh, do not satisfy this condition uh, is thrown out. So we, we don't consider them. And so what is this condition? It says that the fusion, so if you multiply xi, so for every pair, xi and xi plus one, you take the left one, xi, you multiply it, you multiply it by the, this chosen element alpha, you require x i plus one to be inside, to be inside the result of this multiplication. And this is dictated by the fusion ring. So because of this uh, condition, the Hilbert space is not factorized, uh, meaning that it's not just the tensor product 
of a bunch of you know uh, on-site n-dimensional uh, Hilbert spaces. So let's see an example. So let's just consider the Hau Wolf symmetry. Um, as I said, it has n labels because there are n there are six. Sorry, there are six labels because there are six indecomposable elements, and we choose uh, this alpha to be rho. So this this uh, distinguished element is rho. <clears throat> if you have just one site, then before imposing the fusion rule, uh, clearly the Hilbert space is six dimensional. Okay, but if you require, if you impose this requirement, the only possibilities are rho, a rho, and a square rho. So it goes from six dimensional to three dimensional. So for example, one is not allowed, why? Take one, multiply by rho, it's just rho, right? So rho is not one, but I, I, need, it, I need the results of the multiplication to contain one, right? And likewise for a and a squared. If you have two sites, um, then you go from 36 dimensional to 15 dimensional. And just uh, for example, um, one one is not allowed for a similar reason. A row is not allowed because A row uh, is, you know, A row, not, not, uh, not row. <clears throat> um, but row row is allowed, right? So row row has a bunch of stuff. And in particular, uh, row itself appears. Okay, so this is just a this is a characteristic feature of any anion shape. Uh, um, sorry, is it the, what's the fusion kind of the fusion rule one with one? Why is it one one not allowed? Sorry. Okay, Am I missing so something? Why is one one not allowed? Because so it's it's because of this rule. Oh uh, sorry. So the rule oh, sorry, because, that, no, because of this rule. Okay, okay, I understand. I understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah, so there's a distinguished the element row. You multiply one with that row, and then you require the next state to be I understand. Uh, inside. Good. Hi, uh, Ying. Um, so the definition, th this constraint, is it clear it's parity invariant? Or generally, maybe it's not? Uh, generally, it's, it's not. It depends on sort of the, the Hamiltonian you choose. Right, so here I'm only talking about sort of what the Hilbert space is. I didn't right. use the, the Hamiltonian. Right, right, right. Sorry, Sorry. Ying, uh, did you explain what is the motivation for choosing this uh, specific uh, role as the vertical um, segments? So if you choose an invertible element, it's going to be trivial, right? Mm -hmm. Because uh, Xi, is going to determine uniquely xi plus one, right? So there's right. basically just one, well, it, it's too trivial. Um, and then of course you can choose, you can choose row, you can choose a row or a squared row. Um, we just chose one of them. So the claim is that uh, if you cho chose it to be something else, it will again flow to some, some phase that's uh, symmetric under the full uh, good. category, but right. it just so, might not be a CFT that you, that you expect. Maybe some uh, breaking phrase. So sorry. So not exactly. So at least in the in the Hau Wolf case, mm -hmm. um, because because rho a rho and a squared rho are sort of symmetric. You know, they're permuted by the z three symmetry. Yes. So I I don't think the choice among the three matters. Yes. For a more general fusion category, uh, there are multiple inequivalent choices. Right. The statement is that they all define distinct lattice models, but they all have built in the same built-in symmetry. Mm -hmm. And because there are different lattice models, of course, the phase diagrams mm -hmm. and whether there's a CFT, they can all be different. Right. right. But for the Hau symmetry, there's basically, this is the only non-trivial choice to mm -hmm. make. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, so I just want to mention, if you, are, if you don't like this non-factorized Hilbert space, it turns out that you can also just consider an ordinary quantum spin chain, and you just add penalty terms to forbid you know, the violation of this rule I mentioned. And in practice, you don't, so this, this will be valid if you take the you know, penalty terms to say, to, to be very large, but in practice, you, you don't, you actually don't need it to be very large, right? And 
um, a next nearest neighbor Hamiltonian with suitably chosen P will have the input data as the built-in symmetry, <laughs> right? So um, I write it this way to make a manifestly invariant under lattice shift, right? Every site is the same. Um, this P has to be chosen uh, appropriately to preserve the built-in symmetry. And uh, it can be constructed from the data of the six J symbols. So that's a part of the data of the generalized symmetry that I, I did not you know, explain in detail. But, but there are such P's. This construction is, uh, is called an anion chain because originally it was sort of motivated by anions in 3D systems. But more generally, this input data, so all you need to have this input data is actually a uh, 2D generalized symmetry whose mathematical structure is actually more general than anions, right? So there's a, it's a very um, simple generalization. Now, uh, your problem, as we all know, if you have a 1D quantum spin chain, there's, there's always a corresponding 2D classical spin chain. Um, and likewise here, there are 2D stepneck models that take the same input data and whose anisotropic limit gives precisely the 1D anion chain. And this, these 2D stepneck models um, were, they were constructed independently by, uh, by these two groups uh, last year. So uh, before proceeding, I have to mention that, um, so uh, uh, another paper that appeared on the same day. So uh, we were working on this problem of finding a, a uh, Haoop CFT for several months. And then we found, that, we found out that another group actually has also been working on the same problem um, although they are using more of a uh, statnec approach. So uh, we coordinated to post uh, our, you know, our existing results on the same day. And this is the other paper. Um, and these people, they are, they are top numerical experts in the field. So if you paid attention, you might recognize that, for instance, uh, these two names were also here. Uh, actually, uh, yeah, Lutins as well. Um, so I think the maybe the, the bootstrap analogy, analogy would be um, like you, you try to use SDPB to study some bootstrap problem. And then after a while, you find that there's some other group with, say, like two or three PIs in this collaboration uh, working on it, uh, including, say, the creator of SDPB, David. Um, yeah. So so this is what, uh, so anyway, so this is what, what happened. <clears throat> All right. Um, so I've explained right. that uh, there did, are. So did you say that whether their results were consistent with yours or you didn't? Uh, it, it is, it is consistent. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> All right, so I've explained that there are anion chains and step neck models that have this built-in Hagerup symmetry, uh, sorry, Hagerup symmetry. Um, the question now is, is there one uh, whose continuum limit is CFT? Is there a choice of a Hamiltonian whose continuum limit is CFT? And uh, even though sort of most of uh, us are theorists, we first resorted to um, numerical methods. So, to study uh, lattices, um, here are two standard methods. Um, so one is called the density matrix renormalization group. And if I have to give a one sentence explanation of what it is, um, it approximates the ground state as uh, something called a matrix product state. So it's an ansatz. And then it applies, it uses some variational algorithms to minimize the energy. Uh, the second method is called exact diag diagonalization. <laughs> what it does is instead of diagonalizing the whole matrix, so we have a you know have a giant matrix, um, 
instead of fully diagonalizing it, you just try to find numerically find the low lying eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And on the right, I show you sort of a comparison of the strengths and uh, weaknesses of the two methods. And they are quite complementary, actually. So for DMRG, um, because of so because we're making this ansatz, we can go to uh, larger system sizes, so you know longer chains, um, and it approximates the ground state very well, as well as a few excited states. But it comes it becomes more and more unreliable um, as you go up. <clears throat> By contrast, for exact diagonalization. Uh, it's computationally more, more intensive, so you can't really go to a very large system. Um, but the advantage is that you can get many uh, states, many low-lying states uh, quite reliably. So DMRG allows us to get closer to the continuum limit, um, so we don't have to doubt, our, doubt ourselves about you know, whether we're just seeing you know, the, the mirage of uh, finite size effects. Um, whereas for exact diagonalization, it allows us to reliably simulate sort of not just a few states, but like a whole spectrum, including some highly excited states. All right, so now we're going to look for, so first I'm going to convince you that it's a CFT, and then we're going to look at sort of this, this spectrum. So let's just first uh, discuss the signatures of the CFT. So the first thing uh, we look at is uh, the gap between the, the ground state and the first excited state. So if the continuum is indeed a CFT, we expect this difference, this delta E, to scale like one over L in the continuum limit. But the reason is very simple. CFT has no dimensional parameter, so this is just dimensional analysis. More generally, in a gapless phase, uh, so if it's it doesn't if it if it's not relativistic, not necessarily relativistic, then delta E will scale as uh, L to some power, L to the minus Z. <clears throat> in the gap phase, Z is zero, which means just means that this goes to a constant, whereas for CFT, Z is one. And given your sort of numerical data, you can estimate Z by fitting to, so you can fit to this, this, uh, this form that we expect in the continuum limit. So here's the data. Um, first, so, so, the, so we Sorry. plot delta E. Can I yeah. interrupt you for a second? Uh, I missed, did you define what the Hamiltonian is? I did not define it in detail. I said that um, it can be written in this form and this P, so the, the term at each site uh, is constructed from the six trace symbols of the generalized symmetry of the fusion category. Is it somehow a canonical choice or you just- It's a canonical, it's canonical. It? It's canonical. Okay, thanks. Yeah. I. Yeah, I can tell you in more detail um, after the talk if you want. And how many parameters do we have in this Hamiltonian preserving the generalized symmetry? Right. So this depends on the which which generalized symmetry it is. For the Hawup, there are uh, okay. So naively there are four such p's, but there's one linear there's one linear relation. So there are three independent ones. But there's also, so the overall normalization of the Hamiltonian is also unphysical. So you get rid of one more. So there's two, there's two like actual physical degrees of freedom that you can tune. I see. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, so thanks for the clarifying questions. So anyway, so, uh, I told you that there are two, and so basically we just we just picked one of them. Uh, I, I, I will explain this um, towards the end of the talk. Um, but so right now we just have one Sorry, concrete but, Hamiltonian. But it's important, right? If you're saying that there are two parameters, then basically you want the gap to close, right? And uh, it might not 
I mean, in general, if I don't know anything about it, I will not expect it to close. Like, why, does, why, why has the BSFT generally expect that you have to tune this parameter to some very specific point? And you're kind of brushing this off, saying that you just pick some and it works out. Like, what is, why did it work out? Um, great. So, can you wait until the end? I will comment on it. On it. Okay. But can you yeah. just say, do you have to tune this parameter somehow, or do you just have some way to figure it? No. No, you don't. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. So, um, there's there's evidence suggesting that you have a CFT in a full two-dimensional subregion of this two-dimensional parameters coupling space. Okay. And this is just sort of one point in that region. Um, yeah, so, but because it's a full region, so you don't, you don't have to tune. <laughs> All right, so what's shown here is, so let me just remind you. So delta E is the gap between the first excited state and the ground state. So what's shown here is delta E plotted over the system size L. And in, this is in log scale. So you see, first of all, that you know, they fall quite nicely along a straight line. And if you do the fit, you can extract what this uh, Z is. And you see that it's um, very close to one as is, is expected for a CFT. So, so, sorry, okay. just, uh, just uh, related to the previous question. So. When you make this plot, of course, you are still choosing specific, specific values of these two parameters. So the constant part yes. would depend on these parameters, but you're just picking one. Sorry, what, what constant part? Like when you plot the log, the constant part presumably also depends on the marginal parameters. Yes. But here you're just but picking I'm, some specific values <coughs> to make the plot. Yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm just, I'm fixing one point in the coupling space. And, I, and I'm just making these plots. Good, yeah. Okay, so the next thing we can look at is the entanglement entropy in, so, okay, so if, if it, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> so if um, the continuum limit is indeed a CFT, then in the ground state, uh, the entanglement entropy between an interval of length uh, little l and its complement has a uni universal form. Um, so the details is not that important, but you should know that. So the formula depends only on the system size l, the interval length little l, and also the central charge c as an overall, overall constant. The shape. Okay, so now that we have simulated the, the, the ground state, um, say by DMRG, um, we can compute this entanglement entropy. And the shape of S as a function of little l, first it provides a check that this is a CFT because we can see if it obeys this universal form. And it furthermore allows us to estimate the central charge. Uh, Ying, but I thought that DMRG by construction because it's an MPS, uh, is always guaranteed to follow the area law, right? What? Uh, what do you mean? Uh, so I so if I understand MPS correctly, I think MPS by construction always has area law entropy. Well, so yeah, I, I mean it can be used to estimate C, but I'm not sure if it provides a check for CFT unless you got this data from. Uh, exact diagonalization. So in a sense, so, the answers you take for MB MPS is guaranteed to uh, give you this shape. Maybe I'm not understanding exactly what area law is, but if you tune your if you tune the couplings to uh, a point where that is not CFT, then you you don't see this behavior. So I'm not no, sure. Maybe I can comment. I think what Minji has in mind is that if you fix your MPS bond dimension and if you go to a very, very long L, then you will see you will not see. You will stop seeing this. Right. Thing, but you don't, you're not doing I this, see. obviously. That, that, that's yeah. right. That's right. Of yeah. course, 
when L oh, goes, I see. when L is increased, you have to increase your bond dimension to to really approximate your uh, your ground state. So it's uh, an order of limit issue. Oh, I see. I see. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Lava. Yeah. I see. Mm -hmm. Oh, in uh, just one quick question. So this anionic chain is unitary, is that right? Yes. Okay, thank you. The the canonical construction of the Hamiltonian, which which Peter just asked about, um, if your input fusion category is unitary, then uh, the Hamiltonian is guaranteed to be Hermitian. Okay, I see. So this is really the central charge, not a C. Yeah, not a C effect. Okay, thank you. Yeah, this is the central charge. So, okay, so first, so this is the data and uh, the, okay, the, the green to red is not that important. It just, it's just the DMRG sweeps. So just look at the red, which is the, the stable, the final stable result. And you see that it, well, it fits the, the, the this functional form uh, to reasonably well uh, accuracy. And the fit of the central charge, you see it's kind of close, it's quite close to two. So now let me put on my theorist cape and just say, assume, let me just interpret the result as C being exactly two. Okay, so um, as evidenced by the entanglement entropy. So now, now I want to discuss uh, the finite size scaling. So if the continuum is CFT, then we expect that the, the energies on the lattice uh, will take this form. So there's one term that is extensive with the, set, with the system size. And then the next uh, subleading term is inversely proportional to L and it's uh, proportional to, uh, I guess what, what we call the energy on the cylinder of the CFT. So, so Delta minus C over 12. And then there's this uh, V um, which like alpha is a non-universal constant. So we can, so equipped with this, you know, with this expectation, we can fit the ground state energy. Uh, since it's the ground state, we set delta to zero and we fit it over L, which allows us to estimate alpha and the product of V and C. And we assume that C is two, so we also get V. <clears throat> and this way we can translate the energies you get from the numerical lattice simulation to scaling dimensions in the CFT, well, to the CFT. And let me make a side comment that um, this, this way of just using the ground states to make the fit has the advantage of having smaller, you know, finite size corrections um, than had we used excited states. So I don't expect you to uh, learn too much from these plots because this this shows you alpha, but you can't really see v v times c, you know, in this plot. Um, but I do want you to notice that DMRG and exact diagonalization they uh, completely agree um, for the the cases that for, for the overlapping cases. <clears throat> All right, so. Um, uh, so we we are I haven't I have told you enough to um, you know show you the the spectra, but because this is a bootstrap seminar, I will first present something that we all know and love, and that thing is modular invariance. So given the numerical spectra, so I've told you how to get how to translate from the lattice energy e to the scaling dimension delta. Um, we can compute. Okay, so you also need the sort of the, the spin, but I'll, I'll talk about that later. But anyway, you can compute the partition function on a torus, okay, uh, with modulus tau. And uh, as we all know, modular invariance implies that Z is invariant under tau to minus one over tau. If you restrict to a square torus, um, so in this case, you only need to know delta, you don't need to know the spin, um, then uh, this is, this is what we expect, which uh, says that Z is a symmetric function of log tau two. So tau two is the imaginary part of tau. It's, it's a symmetric function of log tau two if you set tau one to zero. So this is something we can check. And this is the result uh, using our numerical data. 
Um, the different curves are for different system sizes. So L going from six to 13 in increments of three. So you see that in the beginning, it's not very symmetric, but once you go to get to 15 and also 18, it looks quite symmetric. Um, so you see the, the red curve is 15 and the purple curve is 18. Right, so, so it's a nice check um, that it's a CFT. And this plot was made by assuming C uh, exactly equaling two. But we can also treat C as a, as a variable. <clears throat> and you can estimate C by, by modular invariance. So by demanding that, since we expect it's, it's a symmetric, in particular, the derivative vanishes um, you know, when, tau, when tau two is one. So you can estimate C by this condition. And at L equals 16, you get something that is reasonably close to C equals two. Um, all right, so I, I think I'm running out of time. Um, so, uh, uh, so I will, I will now show you the spectra in the Z3 neutral sector. Um, so recall that this in this sector, rho has these two possible eigenvalues. Um, the, the one with the rho plus, they are the ones that preserve the symmetry. For example, the identity operator, the stress tensor, and say other uh, preserving, uh, symmetry preserving deformations. <clears throat> Our Hamiltonian is an invariant under lattice shift. So momentum P is a good quantum number. Um, the momentum P manifests when you, so if you shift the lattice by one site, then a momentum eigenstate acquires a phase that just takes this form. In particular, the P has periodicity L. And furthermore, uh, it turns out that our Hamiltonian is in there under parity. So it suffices to just show P non-negative. So what we will do is we will show zero, one up to L over two. So I won't show the negative part since they're because of symmetry. The Hilbert space decomposes into sectors labeled by P and also representations of the ha of the Hawu ring. If if it's a CFT, then we also expect like all the states to organize into Verisoro families and have to obey unitarity bounds. We will see that you know these fine details are not really perfect if, if we're only at L equals eighteen, but they're still sort of decent enough. Um, first, I want you to think of this momentum P as just the spin in the continuum CFT. So this is the spectrum at L equals 12. Um, and before, okay, so before discussing, okay, so I, I labeled a few features. There are these dashed lines, uh, this blue oval and this uh, red box. Um, I will discuss them one by one. But first, so first let's look at some, some prominent, well, some states that have clear explanations. So here is the identity, just the vacuum. If you follow this 45 degrees line, you see there's another state with the correct quantum numbers um, to be the stress tensor, <clears throat> right? So, and if we look at the first excited scalar, which I label by O, if, the, if you again follow this 45 degree line, you, you find a state that is a, a candidate for it's a level one descendant. So it looks like, you know, you cannot trust the high, highly excited states, but uh, for these states, it seems like it's, it's quite consistent. And you can go to L equals 15, L equals 18, and uh, you see the feature is very stable. Another important feature is that you see there is no state with uh, P equals one and delta equals one. So um, it suggests that there is no spin one conserved current. Next, let me talk about the blue oval. So this, this is quite important. <clears throat> you see, there are many states with small, small delta, but very large P. If P literally were just the spin in the CFT, then we're in big trouble because they severely violate um, the unitarity bound. All right, so what's going on? 
uh, let's look at the states in the blue oval first. So these have like sort of the lowest delta and uh, large P. So um, on the right, I show you from L equals 12 all the way to L equals 18. And you can see a pattern. You see that the blue oval has P equals L over three. So shift by one site gives a phase that is just a, a third root of unity. What this means is that in the continuum limit, there is an extra Z3 symmetry, not to be confused with the Z3 that's intrinsic to the, the Hauwa. Um, and we will, sorry, we will refer to it as a shift Z3. Yeah. Is, uh, is this Z3 symmetry anomalous? Uh, no. It's not. You, you know that by by looking at the uh, function? Yeah, that's one way to, to uh, so um, if your Hamiltonian is parity symmetric, I think it's inconsistent for the shift symmetry to be anomalous. Mm -hmm. So that, that's another way to, to, to understand it. Okay, so a one site lattice shift is not just in the, in the continuum language, it's not just translation on the circle. It's a combination of translation and this shift Z3 symmetry. So let me label the Z3 charge by Q. The relation is the momentum is, you know, P is S plus uh, Q over three times L. And the blue oval states, if you just you know, look at this formula, they have spin zero, but they are charged under the shift Z3. All right, so these, these guys are to be interpreted as shift Z3 charged scalars. <clears throat> and because, you know, the spin is zero, the unitary bound is okay. All right, so, so there's no problem. Um, but well- Can you I say again, how did you determine the relation between translation and, that, and the spin and the Z3? Uh, you mean wh why this formula is true? Yeah. Uh, uh, well, I, I'm not sure how to explain it further than just saying, well, you expect a lattice shift to be a combination of the two. So when you do one lattice shift, uh, you get e to the two pi i p over l, right? And that should be a product of what you expect from the continuum spin together with an action of the internal Z3 symmetry. And if you just take the log of that relation, you get this. Okay. And earlier you said you, you didn't find the spin bond current in the Z3 neutral sector. Could it be in some other sectors? Well, uh, it could, it could, but if you just look at the data, it's not there. But you think it's just, is the data just, the data you are showing to us are the Z3 neutral state? Oh yeah, you mean the intrinsic Z3 charge sector? Yes. Uh, it could be, but they're not there. Okay. I, yeah. I, I, I'm not showing the, the data okay, in the okay. charge sectors. Okay, thank you. Ing, uh, I got a bit confused. So is this new Z3 shift symmetry, is it exactly on the left or not? Sorry, what's the question? What's the is, question? The, is the Z3 symmetry exact on the lattice? Like the new one? Oh, it's, it's not. Uh, on the lattice, it is just part of the lattice shift. Okay. It's part of the it's part of the lattice shift, um, but it becomes an internal symmetry. It becomes not a space time symmetry, but an internal symmetry in the continuum limit. So it is exact on the lattice. It's just it's it's not an intern, It's not an on site symmetry. It's a, it's a lattice shift symmetry. Okay, thanks. Yeah. And it would be fair to say that you just get this. Uh, Z3 by looking at the spectrum, like for example, the fact that there are these extra states coming down, you just guess that there's Z3. It could be, it could in some other model, it could have been Z4 or whatever. You just have to look at the spectrum and guess what this. That's right. That's right. Okay. Can, can I think of this as the ground state not being uh, fully periodic, just being periodic by translation by three units? That there's some yes. kind of unit cell. That... Uh, yes. Yes. Thank you. So let me skip, skip this. Okay, so continuing our discussion of this 
this ship Z3. So why did I show you only you know, L equals 12, 15, and 13, and not the values in between? The spectra of those values in between actually look nothing like when L is divisible by three. And this precisely has to do with the shift Z3 symmetry that we we're just discussing. In general, the presence of a shift symmetry um, implies that uh, when L is not divisible by that periodicity, what we are seeing is not the usual Hilbert space, but it's it's a Hilbert space, it's a twisted Hilbert space with twisted periodic boundary conditions. So let me first show you. So first, this is the L equals 12 spectra that we just saw. This is L equals 11. So you see like the identity is missing and let me just flip between the two a few times. You can see that they, they, they look nothing alike. However, if you jump three ahead and go to L equals 14, then you see some, you see strong similarity. Yeah, Ying, I think okay. this is the answer to, to my question. Yeah, I, I think I was exactly asking this, but only from, I think this is the way you determine that part of the translation becomes an internal symmetry, right? Yeah, this, well, they go hand in hand, looking at those like blue oval states and looking at this. Okay. Yeah, in fact, this, so this Z3 actually, there are hints of it if you just look at the entanglement entropy, entropy curve, uh, which is a detail I did not discuss. But so anyway, there, there are many hints. Well, there, there are many ways to determine that there's this shift Z3. And this is also one way just to, <clears throat> um, okay. So let me explain this lattice shift symmetry further. So recall this relation. This relation holds for all L, okay? But the momentum and the Z3 charge, they're both integers. So just from this relation, it's clear that the spin, what we want to be the spin in the continuum CFT is an integer only if L is divisible by three. When it's not divisible by three, the spin can be fractional. And that is not what we want for like local operators or for states in, a, in, a, in an ordinary Hilbert space. But they are, it's okay if they are uh, in a twisted Hilbert space um, with twisted periodic boundary conditions. So that, that is the, the correct interpretation of um, when L is not divisible by three. And let me show you the features of uh, this twisted spectra. So let's first look at this state phi, which has which preserves how whoop symmetry. And if you follow 45 degree lines, you see you know the candidate uh, level one descendants are there. <clears throat> the, I think the most interesting feature of this data, however, is this guy. So there appears to be a state with P equals one and Delta equals one, at least two with the numerical position. And if you look at L equals 11, you see that this feature is, you know, it's somewhat stable. Um, um, if you look at, uh, so I showed you L equals 11 and 14. If you look at like 10 and 13, it's also there. Uh, I only showed you non-negative P, but if you look at, you know, the negative P, then they're, they're also there. Um, uh, so- Sorry, just to be sure. So uh, does the plot also show the degeneracy? So one dot just means one state? Yes. Um, you don't really expect degeneracies if you take into account all the symmetries, right? This is, you might expect degeneracies in the continuum limit, but on a lattice, you, you know, you have level repulsion, right? So mm -hmm. unless there are symmetry reasons, you don't really expect degeneracies. Mm -hmm. So one so dot example, is one state. Yeah, for example, here you say just a single current, a single current. Yes. Means, it's a, okay. yes. Okay, so all in all, we find four states that have delta equals Delta and S uh, being consistent with uh, them being spin one conserved currents, but they're not spin one conserved currents because they're in the they're in the twisted Hilbert space. They they're not local operators. So what do they mean? The meaning is as follows: Let T be the CFT that we numerically found. If we orbifold T by the shift Z3 symmetry, then you know we add twisted sectors and then we project. So the in the twisted Hilbert spaces. 
the uh, Z3 neutral part becomes um, part of the ordinary Hilbert space of the orbifold theory. Okay, so in other words, if you orbifold by the symmetry, you uh, you liberate these conserved currents. They go from being um, you know in the twisted Hilbert space to the ordinary Hilbert space, which gives them the interpretation of you know actual spin one conserved currents. Uh, Right, in the, in the orbifold theory. So we conclude that the orbifold theory has two pairs of spin one conserved currents. And together with the numerical evidence that C is two, this uh, almost forces it to be a free sigma model on T2. And the lattice shift symmetry commutes with Hau Wolf symmetry. So this orbifold theory also has Hau Wolf symmetry. And um, so a, a work, a, what we're trying to do right now is to analytically um, understand how this Howell Wolf symmetry acts in some free sigma model on T2. Um, right, so I, I already explained this before. So there are actually more couplings you can turn on. What I presented was this particular one. And uh, if you turn on the others, we actually, there are numerical signatures of CFT in a full two dimensional subregion. And we suspect that they might correspond to um, symmetry preserving marginal deformations. So like when, when you guys asked uh, about whether we have to do tuning, um, you, might, you, must be, you might be surprised that I said you don't have to tune. But if the theory really is you know, a free sigma model on T2, then it's, it's no longer so surprising, right? Um, and the investigation of this whole coupling space is also work in progress. Sorry, so um, the sigma model, the moment you do an R before the sigma model on T2, you, you start with four real marginal deformation, you get down to two, right? Uh, sorry, the, there are, uh, yes, yes. So we expect so that, that the whole, the whole uh, conformal manifold of the R before of this T2 as the ha group symmetry? We think, no, we think only um, like, a, a, for example, a two-dimensional, uh, but I'm I'm, I'm saying that the whole conformal manifold is two dimensional. Is the whole conformal manifold is four dimensional? No, but after the but, orbital, it becomes after the orbital it becomes two dimensional. So if you're saying that the, there there is yeah, uh -huh. exactly marginal deformation of the Hager, that suggests that the entire conformal manifold of the orbital is has the symmetry. Isn't that yes. surprising? Uh, it, yeah, it's. It is surprising, but um, it turns out that, you know, we actually know very little about what the generalized symmetries are, even in such a simple theory like free, free sigma model on T2. Um, so I would say it's surprising yet also not so surprising. Why do we- In the end, it's an exotic symmetry realized in an extremely boring theory. Yes. <laughs> Why do yes. we expect the CFT has the Hagura symmetry? Why do we expect it? We well, we found we found numerical so, evidence for it. Uh, oh, I mean, in the limit, it still has the Hagura symmetry. Oh, sorry. What? What limit? In, so you take uh, so in the limit CFT theory, you still uh, expect it, expect that the Hagua symmetry. Are you asking about spontaneous symmetry break? Oh, sorry, yeah, are you asking about spontaneous symmetry breaking? Uh, no, it's just like you cook up some finite lattice model that has the Hagua data built in, but you take the limit. Why? Why you? Uh, why do you expect that it's also there in the limit? Why? Why not? <laughs> why not? <laughs> if, if every element of a sequence has, has a property, then the limiting element has that property. I think that's. Enough. I mean, do you have a do you have a <laughs> counter example to this that may, that motivated your question? Because I, I don't understand why you wouldn't expect that. I see. Okay, so I'm I'm actually doing math, so maybe uh, I'm too rigorous. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> I see. Okay. Uh, so actually, why do you expect to have a marginal uh, operator 
in principle, you can just have like, there's no relevant singlet, then you don't need to fine tune to get a CFT. So why, why marginal here? So, um, okay, so first of all, from the lattice model, there are just these extra parameters, right? So if, if there is no exactly marginal directions, then you, well, okay. So I guess many things could happen. It could be that no matter what you choose, um, you flow to the same CFT. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, right, so that, that is one logical possibility, but preliminary numerical evidence suggests that that's not the case. So you, know, so you mean you simulate different uh, parameters and that you find conformal data like the scaling dimension are different. Is that yes. kind of evidence? Okay, I see. Yes, it's, it's, uh, it's still a work in progress, um, but I would say that the preliminary data suggests so. I see. Yeah, so. So yeah, SU3 so, at level one is a special case of the T2 Sigma model. And it has a mm -hmm. Z3. Mm -hmm. so is it part of the modular space? We we wondered about so it. Cool. Uh -huh. Yeah. I, yeah, Sorry, yeah. Isn't, that oh, gonna... that, isn't that Z3 anomalous? That's why no, was... it's not. No, it's not ah, anomalous. I see. Okay. It's not. Yeah. So uh, all I'm going to say is just that this is work in progress. I see. Okay. It, okay. It's not, well, I mean, it feels like a very simple problem, but I mean, it, Okay. Well, it, it might I not have... be simple, right? It doesn't. It, it probably doesn't commute with the SU three chiral algebra, right? So it, 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 it clearly <laughs> definitely does not. does not. Yeah, it definitely. Yeah, definitely does, does not. not. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, yeah, but since since I have excellent collaborators, I hope you can trust me that this is a non-trivial problem. Yeah, I believe you. <laughs> <laughs> well, so maybe I missed this, but in the anion chain, if you if you change your is that rho or alpha? If you change that. It's still going to be the same. Yeah, you're. Yes. Oh, it doesn't matter which uh, which row you which row you it, chose. Yeah, all you're going to do is going to change. You're going to sort of uh, mix up the parameterization of J one, J row, and J a row. I see. Cool. But you're not going to really change the the, the model. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, Ying, I forgot if you have said it. Uh, so how does the scalar gap depend on this uh, marginal, I mean, this parameters you can tune? The scalar gap? Yeah, in the Z3 symmetric sector that you presented. It, it changes. When you, when you how does tune. it change? Like what kind of maximal value does it reach? And Oh, uh, we're not at that point yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so but if, if, but if it were to have a single model description, you should see that you can lower it arbitrarily. By two yes, that's true. Oh, yeah, that's true. So the problem, okay, so indeed, we do see that when you tune the parameters, there's some kind of boundary where the gap sort of closes. Mm -hmm. um, but because the Hamilton, so the Hamiltonian, the overall normalization of the Hamiltonian is unphysical. So, you, you know, you have to normalize things carefully. And yeah. it's just very hard to study numerically those points, right? When the gap closes, you have so many low-lying states. It's very hard to simulate numerically. So we can't can really trust. Can you kind of see. track the stress tensor and normalize by the stress tensor? You, you could, but what I'm saying is that um, at those points, I expect that you have to go to much larger L to really trust the rest of the, the spectrum, I even see. the stress tensor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I missed some part of the discussion. Was there were, were there any statements made? I think I've overheard some statements about chiral algebra, how it commutes with the chiral algebra. Oh, um, so Shu Hong was asking whether uh, SU2 at level one could have how Wolf symmetry. SU3, SU3. Yeah, sorry, SU3 at yeah. level one could have how Wolf symmetry. And it could, but it definitely does not commute with the, the whole car of the, you know, the cuts moody. Okay. And, and here in, in your CFT that you're finding, uh, it would commute with whatever kind of algebra you have. I would, mm, no, well, at least in the, T, in the, in the Sigma model on T2, 
a uh, no because the these U1 these uh, conserved currents they do not preserve ha the Hau Wolf symmetry, right? So the eigenvalue is rho minus. So no, it does not commute with the U1 currents. Okay. Any more, any more questions? I'm, I'm sorry for running over time so much. All right, so. Uh, uh, oh, oh, sorry. Uh, I just have a general question. So for this anionic chain and the Hamiltonian you wrote down, if the input is a general fusion category, what's the number of parameters you have in this Hamiltonian? Is there an easy way to understand the number of parameters in terms of there, the fusion there category? Uh -huh. There is. Um, I, I, can, I, can, I can explain it to you later, but it's very okay, simple. Right. Okay, okay. All right, so um, since I'm running out of time, let me skip a few remarks. Um, let me just say that uh, Yuji also recently gave a talk about this work. And it's available on his YouTube channel. It has many more mathematical and theoretical details that I omitted in my talk. So please watch it if you're interested or if you, or if you didn't like my talk. Um, so I prepared some more things to say, but since I'm over time, let me, let me just end here. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you for your attention. Thank you very and much. I welcome comments and questions. Thank you very much. We had a lot of questions. But if there's something, oh, is it in the, in the chat? I don't know if there's any in the. I don't see any in the chat. I, I just did this. So this torus theory is is indeed boring. But does this imply that the the theory that you get is also some sort of torus because it's because it's torus or befolded by this Hager up? So should we conclude that the original theory is also boring? So I. Yeah, so, so um, there are many ways to view this. So, okay, so at least for me, even though the theory is boring, realizing an exotic symmetry in it is still interesting to me. So that's just my personal subjective taste. But you can, another thing you can do is, well, if such a boring CFT actually contains an exotic symmetry, then if we try to study, you know, all the symmetries that these boring theories have, we're going to discover more and more exotic symmetries, more and more fusion categories. So at least there's some, there's, there seems to be like very rich mathematics that one can uncover from what physicists think as boring theories. So that's, that's one thing. Um, uh, and then, um, so this boring theory, if you go to, rational points, um, I think there might be some interesting things because rational CFTs uh, have uh, more structure and their relations to like three-dimensional TQFTs. So I think, I think um, there's still a lot of physics to be, to be learned from this. Okay. Of course, uh, at least when, when I started, uh, when I started doing sort of doing this project, I was I was indeed hoping that I would find some like new exotic CFT that we didn't know before, and I think that is still a possibility. I mean, there there are lots more uh, exotic generalized symmetries, and one could again study them and ask for their realization in CFT, and I I think that it's still possible that we will find, you know, new CFTs that way. It just happens that in this Hawul example, it seems that it's possible to realize it in this boring theory of a, of a, free, th of a free signal model. Okay. If there are no other questions, we can thank you again. And uh, thanks. Okay.